Welcome to this sermon from Silver Lake Baptist Church. Our mission is to celebrate the greatness of God with all we are for the joy, hope, and renewal of our community. We are so glad you have chosen to listen to our message. We pray you will be blessed by your time with us today. I really thank God for Sonora and the good work. I was just sitting there listening to how it took a daughter to honor her father. But what encourages me more is what Cindy said. Fathers don't have to be perfect. <laughs> you know, it only takes, mothers are so lucky, it only takes them one instance to be a mother. Once a mother, always a mother. Nobody doubts their motherhood. But being a father is like shaving. <laughs> no matter how you do it today, you still have to do it tomorrow. And this is the big difference between bad jokes and dad jokes. <laughs> you know the difference? The first letter. Yeah. <laughs> I'm really thankful. It's, I actually did preach last year's Father's Day. And I thought, Pastor James is playing a joke on me. <laughs> He's going to have me up here preaching on every Father's Day. <laughs> And I thought I'm going to be the brightest father in that house today. So I'm going to dress, I'm going to dress the women today. I'm going to dress in yellow and look like the sun in front of the church. But I want us to talk about built for battle. The message today is built for battle. And if you will, I'll request you to stand with me. And we are going to read a very extensive passage in the Bible. 1 Samuel chapter 17. And if you can stand the whole of it, great. If not, it's okay. 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 1 to verse 47. This is what the Bible says. Now the Philistines gathered their armies together to battle and were gathered in Soko, which belongs to Judah, they encamped between Soko and Azeka, the Ephes Damin, in Ephes Damin. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together, and they encamped in the valley of Elah, and drew up in battle array against the Philistines. The Philistines stood on a mountain on one side, and Israel stood on a mountain on the other side, with a valley between them. And a champion came out of the camp of the Philistines, named Goliath from Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. He had a bronze helmet on his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail. And the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze, and he had bronze armor on his legs and a bronze javelin between his shoulders. Now the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his iron spearhead weighed 600 shekels, and a shield bearer went before him. Then he stood and carried out and cried out to the armies of Israel and said to them, Why have you come out to line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine and you servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourselves and let him come down to me. If he's able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and servants. And the Philistines said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. When Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Verse 12. Now David was the son of that Ephrathite, Ephrathite of Bethlehem, Judah, whose name was Jesse, and who had eight sons, and the man was old, advanced in years in the days of Saul. The three oldest sons of Jesse had gone to follow Saul to the battle. The names of these three sons who went to battle were Eliab, the firstborn, next to him, Abinab, and third, Shammah. David was the youngest, and the three oldest followed Saul. But David occasionally went and returned from Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. Verse 16, and the Philistine drew near and presented himself 40 days, morning and evening, when Jesse... Then Jesse said to his son David, Take now for your brothers an ephah of this dried grain, 
and these ten loaves and run to your brothers at the camp and carry these ten cheeses to the captain of their thousands and see how your brothers fare and bring back news of them. Now Saul and they and they and all the men of Israel were in the valley of Elah fighting with the Philistines. So David rose early in the morning, left the ship with a keeper and took the things and went as Jesse had commanded him. And he came to the camp as the army was going out to the fight and shouting for battle. For Israel and the Philistines had drawn up in battle array, army against army. And David left his supplies in the hands of the supply keeper, ran to the army and came and greeted his brothers. Then as he talked with them, there was the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, came up from the armies of the Philistines and spake according to the same words. So David heard them and all the men, and when they saw the man, fled from him and were dreadfully afraid. So the men of Israel said, Have you seen this man who has come up? Surely he has come up to defy Israel, and it shall be that the man who kills him, the king will enrich with great riches and will give him his daughter and give his father's house exemption from taxes in Israel. Then David spoke to the men who stood by him, saying, What shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? And the people answered him in the same manner, saying, So shall it be done for the man who, who kills him. Now Eliab, his oldest brother, had when he spoke to them, and Eliab's anger was aroused against David. And he said, Why did you come down here? And with whom did you have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your pride and the insolence of your heart, for you have come to see their battle. And David said, What have I done now? Is there not a cause? Then he turned from him towards another and said the same thing. And these people answered him the same as the first ones did. Now when the words of David now when the words which David spoke were heard they reported them to Saul and he sent for him then David said to Saul let no man's heart fail because of him your servant will go and fight with this Philistine verse 33 and Saul said to David you are not able to go against the Philistine to fight with him for you are a youth and he, a man of war from his youth, but David said to Saul, Your servant used to keep his father's sheep. And when a lion or a bear came and took a lamb out of the flock, I went out after it and struck it and delivered the lamb from its mouth. And when it arose against me, I caught it by its beard and struck it and killed it. Your servant has killed both lion and bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, seeing that he has defied the armies of the living God. Moreover, David said, The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. So Saul said to David, Go, and the Lord be with you. So Saul clothed David with armor, and he put a bronze helmet on his head. He also clothed him with a coat of mail. David fastened his, his sword to his armor and tried to walk, for he had not tested them. And David said to Saul, I cannot walk in this for I have not tested them. So David took them off. Then he took his staff in his hand, and he chose for himself five smooth stones and from the brook and put them in a shepherd's bag, in a pouch which he had. And his sling was in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistine. So the Philistine came and began drawing near to David. And the man who bore the shield went before him. And when the Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained him. For he was only a youth, ruddy and good looking. So the Philistine said to David, Am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cast David with his gods. And the Philistine said to David, Come to me and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. Then David said to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword, with a spear, with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day, the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you and take you ahead from you. And this day, I will give the carcasses of, of the camp of the Philistines to the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. 
Then all the assembly shall know that the Lord does not save with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you for your word. Thank you, Father, for the reading of it. I pray, mighty God, that this word will minister to us today for the, minister, uh, for the person speaking it and the person listening to it alike. At this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may have your seats. Build for battle. Heroes don't make battles. Battles make heroes. Throughout history, we've seen so many people that were defined by a moment of heroism. When they were faced with different circumstances and they rose up to the task. What we are reading about in 1 Samuel chapter 17 is no different. David was not a soldier. David did not go to the battle line prepared. David arose because of the situations around him. There was, there was a battle raging. And it is because of this battle that the innermost of David was exposed. What he really believes, where he really stands. And he became a hero made of that battle. Today I want to not give a complete list, but a suggestive list of three areas of attack that the enemy will attack us as believers. I want us to understand that there are secrets to winning spiritual battles. I also want us to discover that there is an arsenal that God has put in us at your disposal that you may be able to fight every battle for your soul and for your loved ones. You are not left as orphans. You are not sitting like sitting ducks. God has put in you what it takes. You may not believe that this morning, but I want to show us through this word uh, that, we've spoke, that we've read today that there are areas in your life that the enemy will attack, but God has armed you up. Now, the first thing that the enemy will do when he wants to discourage you, when he wants to bring you down, the one area that you're going to do is going to disqualify you. The enemy will seek to disqualify you. Look at verse 28, where we've read, David has shown up in battle, he's bringing bread to his brothers, and he leaves the bread with the, with the supplies keeper and runs to the battle line. And when he starts inquiring, his brother says this to him in verse 28. Now Eliab, his oldest brother, heard when he spoke to the men, and Eliab's anger was aroused against David. And he said, hear this, why did you come down here? Why did you come down here? Let us dissect what Eliab is telling David. Eliab is telling David, this is not your place. Why did you come down here? This is not your place. This is not your battle. This is not your thing. This is not your place. And then he says to him, and with whom did you leave those few sheep in the wilderness? He's suggesting that David has another place where he can do good. <laughs> He's suggesting that his place is in the wilderness. His place is not in the battlefield, not in the front lines. He is not a soldier. He is not trained for it. And the enemy is going to speak through people to disqualify you from an assignment and a place where has God has called you to be. You don't speak good English. You don't understand the culture. You are too old. You are too young. It's not the right time. The enemy seeks to disqualify David. And so Eliab says, this is not your place. Why, who have you left those few sheep in the wilderness with? And the attack here is on David's place of influence. How many times have you looked at colleagues and thought, or looked at situations where you are at and thought, I cannot say anything in this place. This is not my place. You look at the political arena in the, in the, in the country today and you say, I don't have a voice. 
I'm not a senator, I'm not a House representative. I cannot do anything in this place. But I want to tell you that that is the plan of the enemy to disqualify you, to make you feel as if your voice doesn't count, to make you feel as if you are in a place where you do not belong. We definitely live around Everett. We belong in this community. We can speak of this community. This is our place. The Lord has placed us in this place for such a time as this because it is our place. If the Lord wanted you in Ohio, if he wanted you in New York, if the Lord wanted me in Kenya, I wouldn't be here. But this is my place. Let's start acting like it is our place. Let's start stop acting like, oh, it belongs to others. We are just visiting. It is our place. I call upon you to raise a voice in this place, to raise a voice in that store, to raise a voice in that neighborhood, to speak of the things in this place, for you do not belong to the wilderness, you belong to the battlefront. You don't seem like you are trained for it. David was not, but he still belonged there. And the enemy will seek in every turn to tell you that this is not your place. He tells David, we know you. This is not your thing. You are a sheep's person. You smell like sheep. You look like sheep. <laughs> you know, we smell like iron because we are, we are soldiers and ammunition, but you smell sheep. We can smell you from a thousand miles away. This is not your place. Go back to where you belong. The world and the enemy will seek to silence you in the marketplace. And we see it a lot with everything that comes up. We see it every day with the minorities or the same minorities trying to take their stand. We see it when they are trying to get prayer out of the school system. We see it when they try to say you cannot call on God. You cannot pray in the beginning of a meeting. You cannot say, oh, if God wills. Because to them, you do not belong here. You are here just to be seen, not to be heard. But we are changing that. Like David, we are asking questions. We are walking into this battlefield that we've never been in. We occasionally visit. The Bible says he occasionally went there. It was not his place. But when he got there, he decided, okay, I've been visiting enough. <laughs> So much with this occasional visiting and bringing bread. Who is this uncircumcised Philistine? Your voice might look like the smallest and the most insignificant like David's voice was. But that voice was raised and amplified and reported to the king. How I pray that we will start praying prayers and speaking speeches that will be amplified and not heard by White House but heard by heaven. That our king in heaven is going to see, look down and say, who is that? Who is that standing on my behalf? And David understood that he is not going there by his power or by his strength. He understood that there is a power behind him. There is a power that the enemy cannot see that walks and talks and is with you. That enables you to qualify to be in that battle. This is your place. Mm -hmm. I know we don't do this in Baptist churches, but I want you to look at your neighbor and say, this is my place. This is my place. Is my place. <laughs> we must own it. It is my place. Elia was telling David, stop acting out like a warrior. You are a shepherd. How many times have people looked at you and said, uh, stop acting this up. This is not you. you. We know who you are. We know you are a discouraged father. We know you are a discouraged mother. We know you are struggling with finances. We know this about you. We know about your family history. The enemy is going to bring up everything about your past and show you why you do not qualify. Oh, we know you are struggling with sin. You better take it to the cross, though. We know you are having trouble with family members. We know you don't have it all together. 
Nobody does. Nobody does. We are being perfected daily into the likeness of Christ. We are being brought into his likeness day in, day out. We behold him and day, day in, day out we are becoming more like him. One of these days we're going to be glorified, we're going to be perfected. And then just as he is, so shall we be. But in the meantime, it's an uphill struggle. We walk through the narrow and the straight. And we are being perfected daily. We are being carved out as it may. We are being molded as clay. And nothing in you should disqualify you for being the warrior that God has called you to be. You are a warrior. This is your place. You are not acting a warrior. You are a warrior. You may not look like it. You may not sound like it. Surely you do not smell like it. But you are a warrior. You are a warrior. So this is the other thing that he says to him. Look at verse 28 again. He says, why did you come here? And then, with whom did you leave those few sheep in the wilderness? Now listen to the next words. I know your pride. The insolence of your heart. You have come down to see a battle. The enemy is going to attack your motive. This is an attack on David's character. He's saying, I know, I know, I know why you came over here. You are itching to see a fight. And so you came over here to sit over there with a cannibal to see us fight. You want to see blood flow. You are not up to any good. You are not here to help. That's what he's telling him. You are here to watch. Oh, how I pray he knew his little brother. <laughs> because his little brother was full of the Holy Spirit. His little brother had seen God in the backside of the wilderness when there was no one else to, uh, to, 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 to witness and say it is true, he had still seen God. The enemy underestimates the battles and the victories you've had in the past. The enemy underestimates why you are doing what you are doing. Oh, they say it's because he wants to be known. Oh, they say because he wants to build a name for himself. That's what the enemy sees. But God knows what he has put in you. Those testimonies that you had in the backside of the wilderness, those lions and those bears that you've killed, that nobody else knows about. The brothers don't know about it. And if they had that story, they thought it was just a folktale. David is making up. You know, nobody saw the lion anyway, other than David. Nobody saw the bear other than David. It is his word against everybody else. The enemy is going to attack your character. The enemy is going to input ill motive in your life. Let us pause for a moment and remember the heroes of faith. How did they get where they got? Abraham was qualified through obedience. Through obedience. Now he did not look like a big king. He did not look like he was a wealthy person. But everywhere he went, when he took that step and left his father's house and started going, that obedience was imputed to him as righteousness. And with every step, God revealed himself. God reveals himself step by step. He does not show you the end. He knows the end, but he wants you to trust him with your life. Because he knows where he's taking you. Or you may say, oh, I don't have enough time to finish this project. Start it. He tells you to start it. He knows how it's going to be accomplished. I don't think I have enough resources. Great. Obey. <laughs> Oh, I, don't, I think I'm going to be attacked. If I go down to Eve, they're going to take away my wife. If I, if I dig a well, they're going to fight for it like Isaac did. Yes, still dig it. Because the Lord said dig it. Obedience. Abraham was qualified through obedience. Moses was qualified through obedience. He was in the backside of the wilderness, minding his own business, raised a family. He has a wife and kids, and he's working for his father-in-law. God bless his soul. <laughs> <laughs> He has a full life. His life has gone all around. He's almost going to the close of his life and saying, I've lived a good life. I've raised a family. And God calls him in the midst of a burning bush and says, Moses, I'm calling you out to go to Egypt. He obeyed. 
Moses was qualified because he obeyed. Not because he was a stutterer. He couldn't speak. It will take him 10 minutes to say hello. But God used a stutterer who believed. God used a fugitive who had run away from the law because he believed. Moses was qualified not because he had it together. Let us stop asking people to have it together. Let us ask people to obey. Amen. And as they take one step after another, as they drop that, the, that rod and it becomes a snake and they pick it up and they start a journey going back to where God has called them to do, to their assignment, God will walk with them every step of the way. Amen. There will be pharaohs, there will be plagues, there will be trouble, there will be rebellion, but God will walk with you. He will stand with you. He will stand with you. Moses was qualified, definitely, because of obedience. Now, the story is the same story can be said of Jesus. The same can be said of the twelve, And the same can be said of you and me. We are here not because we deserve it. But we are here because he called us. And we replied and said, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, I am here. Our royalty and obedience to God, hear this, is our only qualification. That's our only qualification to overcome the enemy that seeks to disqualify us in every corner. Martin Luther King says, when the battle rages, there the royalty of the soldier is proved. It is when the battle is raging, quit waiting for the sea to become. It's not happening anytime soon. Quit waiting for everybody to keep quiet. You have to outshout them. Keep waiting for good conditions to be there. There won't be any. We ride in the storm. We sail in that storm. We keep forging forward despite the rebellion and despite the, the, those that are, the forces that are against us. When the battle rages, there the royalty of the soldier is proved. But the enemy will not just seek to discourage you, uh, to disqualify you, will also seek to discourage you. Look at verse 33, where we've read. The Bible says, And Saul said to David, You are not able to go against this Philistine to fight for him, with him. For you are a youth, and he a man of war for his youth. You are not able. How many times have you heard that? You are not able. You do not, quarry, you do not carry the right qualifications. You are not easy for the eye. You know, you, you are not, you are, Pastor James is a lot more handsome than me, though. So they say, you, you, you don't have that TV face. Hallelujah. <laughs> that goes for me and so many others. <laughs> they were not able. They are looking at the wrong place. They are looking at your ability. But war is them because there is him that gives us strength. Amen. I can do all things, not through me, but through him. That gives me strength. When you focus on me, you're focusing on the wrong thing. Because you are right. You are factual. I can do nothing. I'm not able. But you are not counting on him that is carrying me on his shoulders. Amen. I can do not some things. I can do all things. You can do all things through Christ that strengthens you. So Saul looks at David and says, you are not able. One of the most devastating discouragements is being told you are not equal to the task. I'm passionate. David says, I'm passionate. I've seen God in the wilderness. I want to go. And Saul, the highest office in the land, seemingly the most qualified person. The Bible says that Saul was a head taller than everybody else. Seemingly the warrior of warriors. The person with the credentials looks at David and says, you are not able. You are not able. 
That is devastating because it's not just another passerby telling you that. It is the most learned, the most highly credentialed, the highest office in the land telling you you cannot do it. If you had a bunch of preachers who had mega churches look at you in the eye and say you are not able to preach, that will really discourage you. <laughs> because they know it. They've been there. Saul is not just giving a passive opinion. Saul is giving an educated opinion on David. Certainly, if any of us was in that, in that camp that day, we would have told David the same thing. Sadly, that's what we tell some people in our congregation today. We look at their humble estate. We look at their background. We look at their education. We look at where they come from. We look at their past. And we say, you are not equal to the task. And they are crying out, oh, the Lord is calling me. I want to sing. And you're like, Jim looks at you and says, I've been singing for a while. I don't think you can sing. I don't think you can sing. We are sometimes become the conduit. We become the, we become the voice of the enemy in discouraging others like Saul was in telling them they are not able. And then he qualifies why he's not able. He says, for you are a youth. You are a youth. What he's telling him it is, oh, David, this is a man's job. You are applying for a man's job, but you are a youth. In other words, what he's telling him is, David, go away until you become a man, and then you can come back and attempt it. When we look at things through the eyes of the human being, when we look at things in, a, in the fleshly eyes, then we look at things and think, oh, this one is a good idea. I know God is calling me to do this thing, but I need to go home, grow up, and come back a little later. And in that way, we postpone the work of God. We postpone what God could have done today because we are looking at our strength. Well, God is saying, today is the day of salvation. Today I'm calling you. Today I'm asking you to go forth. Today. He is a God of today. He is a God of today. Yesterday is gone. Tomorrow has not come yet. He is the God of the now. The here and now. What is God telling you to do now? The enemy will give you all the ideas why it cannot be done today. Oh, you can... You want to go on missions? Not today. Not today. Oh, you want to minister to that colleague of yours and tell them about Jesus? Not today. I'm going to wait. I'm going to wait until the end of the year when we have the end of the year party. <laughs> then I'm going to corner him for two minutes. And hopefully I'm going to say the word Jesus and love in one sentence. In those two minutes. No. Today, in that break room, Today, when you're walking out on those wires, today, when you drive through that traffic light and you see that person standing there on the side with a placard saying, I'm homeless, it is today. It's today. They might not be there tomorrow. It's today you roll down your window and say, Jesus loves you. Silver and gold, do I, I have none. <laughs> but I'm speaking hope to you. In the name of Jesus. Oh, it's not my character. You know, I'm not really outgoing. Yes. Moses was not outgoing. He was not. He couldn't put together a sentence. But when he had go, he dropped everything. He left his father-in-law's house. You know how difficult that, that, that is? He left his father-in-law's house and left the wife behind. Glad they didn't kill him. But he left because he's a God of today. God is not giving you an assignment today that he wants you to accomplish tomorrow. God reveals something to you today that wants you to accomplish today. This year. 
this season in your life. At your age. Yes, at your age. Because Moses was 80. Age is not a disqualifying factor anymore. Hallelujah. <laughs> Moses are probably older than everybody here, other than maybe two people. Today, you are a youth, Saul tells him. But here's the last thing that Saul tells him. Saul not only seeks to discourage David, but he also seeks to amplify the enemy's ability. He says, you are a youth. In comparison, he is a man of war. How many times do we spend time amplifying the enemy while we should be working on our faith? Hallelujah. How many times do we sit in meetings, deacons meetings and leaders meetings and talk about the problems we are facing with the SBC? Hallelujah. The problem of this convention, the problem of this association, the problem of this church. We are amplifying what the enemy is doing. Saul falls in the same problem. He looks at David and starts speaking of Goliath. He is holding press for Goliath. He's saying, oh, you are a youth. You are not able. But in retrospect, look at Goliath. He is a man of war. He's been a man of war all of his years. Many times people look at you and say, oh, this particular thing you're trying to do, many people before you tried. <laughs> you are not the first person. Everybody else tried. Everybody I know tried. Everybody tried to grow a church. Everybody tried to do this ministry. Everybody tried to go and minister at Walmart. Everybody I know tried to do this thing. You will not be the first and they never succeeded. We must be careful not to amplify the enemy to levels that he is not there. He might be witty, but we have victory. Amen. He might be clever, but we have the truth. He might be slidy and cheating, but we stand in righteousness. Amen. It does not matter how many voices seek to drown your voice, you still are speaking the truth. Speak it like it is the truth. When they give you that microphone and they allow you to stand at every, at, at, at every juncture, they give you an opportunity, speak the truth. Do not say Hold a press for the enemy. Do not speak for them. <laughs> they have far too many people speaking for them. Let's speak for our side. Let's speak of righteousness. Let's speak of kindness. Let's speak of faith. Let's speak of long suffering. Let's speak of regeneration. Let's speak of hope. For we are merchants of hope. Let us speak hope. Let us not speak for the enemy. So the task is amplified to a degree of impossibility in comparison to your strength. The, I've seen that so many times. You want to go to live in the U.S.? It is impossible. Well, I came to the U.S. You want to join the military? It is impossible. Well, I joined. You want to be a church planter? It is impossible. Well, I became a church planter. We can do the same. It, is, it, it always looks impossible if you are relying on your strength, church. It looks impossible when we are looking at this little flock at Silver Lake. But we serve the God of impossibilities. Amen. God of possibilities, I'm sorry. He's able to make a way where there seems to be no way. He creates an avenue where none existed. The Bible says that he creates rivers in a desert place. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. Yeah. We are able. We are not just but youth. We are called of God. And the enemy might be a man of war, but the victory is ours. So David counters what Saul says to him in verse 34. And David says to him, Your servant used to keep the sheep of, the, of his father. And when a lion or a bear came and took a lamb out of the flock, I went out after it and struck it. 
and delivered the lamb from its mouth. And when it arose against me, I caught it by its beard and struck and killed it. Then he says this. He finishes his speech. He says, your servant has killed both lion and bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them. Seeing that, here's the reason. Seeing that he has defied the armies of the living God. David raises the stakes up. He says, it's not about me. It's about who he has defied. Amen. Hallelujah. We are not fighting a battle because of our name, not because of saving the Republican Party, Republican Party. No, 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 that's too low. Mm -hmm. We are fighting a battle because the world has defied the King of Kings. Now, that is a battle worth fighting for. That's a battle you need to put all your arsenal in front of you and go for it. David says, you are looking at a Rudy, young looking, inexperienced young man. But this young man is going to be that battle axe that goes out and fights for his Lord. Because his name is at stake. His name has been. I'm not fighting for Saul. No. I'm not even fighting for the pride of the nation. I'm fighting because his name has been defied. Jesus Christ says, raise me up, and I'm going to draw men to myself. Brethren, our work is to raise him up. We need to be like that donkey that he sat on when he was walking, going into Jerusalem. I'm just going to carry my Lord. And everybody else is going to see the Lord, not me. Very few people are talking about that donkey. They're talking about the Lord. We need to take that position of that donkey. Carry our Lord. Carry him, carry him on high. Uplift his name in the mountaintops, in the rooftops. Speak of him and see him draw men to himself. See him overcome the enemies. See him destroy divorces. See him destroy addictions. See him do great and miraculous things that you never thought possible. See him fill the pews of the church. See him bring people to, to himself. See him cause healings. See him cause families coming back together. We are called to just raise him up. Raise him up. So David says, I am fighting because he has defied the armies of the living God. David is saying, I have seen him yesterday and I will see him today. There's an expectation on David. There is an urgency in David that, yes, I've seen him yesterday. There were victories yesterday in the wilderness, but I want to see him today. How many of us want to see God doing something today? Amen. David says, I want to, yes, I know when the church started in 19, uh, uh, when Pastor Bill started the church, there were great victories in the past, but I want to see those victories in 2022. I want to see today. I want to see a revival today. I want to see this church with young people hanging out, loving Jesus, on fire for Christ. Wanna, it, oh, it is impossible. Not in my strength. It is in his strength. All we need to do is raise him up. Antonio Brown, one of the uh, highest achievers in, uh, in football history, said one day, the battle of getting better, hear this, is never ending. It's never ending. The last thing, then I'm going to be done. Well, I've gone past time, right? The last thing that I'm going to be done that the enemy will try to do to you is to deal you out. It's going to deal you out. He can't, can't disqualify you. He can't discourage you. He will try to deal you out. Verse 38. So Saul clothed David with his armor, and he put a bronze helmet on his head and clothed him with a coat of mail. What Saul was doing, Saul was telling David, yes, you are going to do that assignment, I agree, but you have to do it in my terms. I'm going to determine the terms. The enemy wants to determine the terms. 
The enemy wants to decide your limits and the enemy wants to decide their agenda. The enemy wants to tell you you can only come this far. I agree, I agree. I agree you have strength. I agree you are able to do it, but let us cut a truce. Hallelujah. Don't bother me, and I won't bother you. <laughs> no, that's not the deal. The gates of heads will not withstand us. That is the deal. We are not playing defense. We are playing offense. We are going for the enemy's neck. We are not waiting for him to attack us. Sadly, the church today seems to sit down and wait for the enemy to attack and only react to his attacks. The Bible speaks of an offensive church. The Bible speaks of them that take the kingdom, take it by force. The Bible speaks of an offensive church that goes into the hinter places of the world, in the byways and the highways, winning converts. Go in into all the world. Don't wait for the world to come to you. Go there. It's going to be difficult, but go in. Go ye, for lo, I am with you. Amen. I am with you is a promise of them that are going. You go, I'm going to be with you. The enemy will want to deal us out. The enemy will want to tell us our limits. The enemy wants to tell us, oh, you, can, you, cannot, build a big, you cannot build a bigger building. No, no, this is enough. This is enough. Keep it that way. Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't even think about it. Don't you ever. It's the enemy. Oh, the times are changing. We need to go in this one that way. No, 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 no. We cannot do it. We cannot do it. Can you hear the veiled voice of the enemy in trying to keep you in the normal, in the okay situation, in the comfortable place where, the, where, where God is saying, go forth, break camp and advance. Advance. Do not allow the enemy to determine the terms. Do not let him to decide your limits. Let me finish with this verse because of time. First, David finishes his discourse in chap chapter 17 verse 47 and he says, the Lord saves not with a sword and spear. I love this Next five words. For the battle is the Lord's. For the battle is the Lord's. It's not our fight. It is his fight. And he will give you into our hands. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you. We honor you. Thank Lord for your word. We pray that this morning, Lord, this afternoon, we will be attuned to what you want us to do individually and collectively as a church. I pray, mighty God, that you're going to minister to us that it does not matter how the enemy wants to disqualify us, discourage us, or deal us, that we will follow after you. We'll be passionate for you. And wherever you call us to go, Lord, we shall go not in our strength, but in your strength. In Jesus' name. Thank you for listening. If you'd like to learn more about us, check out our website at www.silverlakebaptist.org.